there are more now military units than there are trains needed for the football game. So some of them won't be on it, but hopefully every train will have at least one military on it, especially 4502. So the 4502 is being held at the MMC and uh, so that there's no chance that it's scheduling will cause it to miss the, the football trains uh, for Army Navy game. So um, there's your tip. Go out and uh, be fun to see that thing out on the road this weekend. So we can uh, move on to the. Uh, Alrighty, we're uh, live on Facebook. So, uh, Mike, would you have the honor, take the honor of introducing Alan? Uh, it is indeed a great honor. Would like to present um, to introduce Alan Furler uh, tonight. He's showing a, a selection of his father's material. His father was Don Furler, uh, one of the better known photographers of the steam era. And uh, joining him tonight for part of the presentation will have Scott Lotus, who's the president of the Center for Railroad Photography and Art, which has been collecting uh, some of the photography and, and uh, photos and negatives of the, uh, some of the masters from the steam era. And, and Don's work is one of them. Um, the, the CRPA produced a book. I don't know if you can see it in the background, produced a book of Don Furler's work, and it is a beautiful book. It is very well produced, and, and the printing is, is exquisite. It really brings out the character of uh, Don Furler's work. So I highly recommend buying the book. But uh, Don has been a friend of Tri-State for many, many years. Um, and we're, we're grateful that he's uh, showing this presentation tonight, and we look forward to it. So, Alan... Um, the show is yours. Thank you very much. I think, Alan, if you're muted. All right, Alan, we see your screen, but we don't hear anything. You don't hear anything? Oh, we there. can hear you now. Okay. All right, perfect. You're all set. Okay. Yeah, I read in my video, so you can't see me moving around. <laughs> Everybody hear me now? Yep, we're, you're good to go. Good, okay. You want my... Sorry, just getting going there. Well, thanks for the invitation. I, uh, I presented to Tri-State in person uh, in Morristown uh, three years ago in November uh, 2018. That's why... Uh, I'm basically using the same title page, but I tagged an attack again on there because this is the uh, second round. The uh, quiet monsters coming to life is, is part of a quote from my dad's words early on in, in uh, correspondence with Trains Magazine as he was expressing his excitement and love of action photography. So that's where that kind of uh, odd phrase come from, comes from. When uh, invited back again, I, I wasn't asked to do anything in particular, but uh, didn't seem appropriate to just uh, rerun my previous show. Um, last time I shared a wide sampling of my dad's photos on about a dozen, dozen different railroads. Uh, tonight, as I, as I got into preparation, I decided to uh, sort of dive down and, and focus a little more. I'm basically gonna talk Erie and Lackawanna tonight with a, with a deeper dive. I, uh, you know, of course, talk about Erie because that was at the hometown road and there's probably more uh, Erie ph photographs that my dad did than anything else. So lots of material that hasn't been seen before. Uh, and of course, I know we've got some people that like Lackawanna here. So I thought I'd try and go, go do some of that as well. <laughs> my, so my deck's been reshuffled and includes new material, but uh, especially if you follow the Center of Rural Photography and Art, you'll, you'll probably recognize some shots too. And of course, Scott is on tap here when I, when I get done to uh, talk a little more about the Center's activities. So to start, I'm just going to show a few uh, introductory shots, uh, just uh, hoping to get you interested again. 
This one I, I used before, this is just my sort of standard disclaimer in the beginning of all my presentations. If you don't like basic three quarter action photography of steam, you know, this won't be a good night. It's kind of what my dad tried to do. He was really interested in, in seeing the details of the locomotives, kind of a carryover from the, the work he'd done earlier in the 30s where everybody was doing engine portraits. As he, he set out to do the best he possibly could with those. And he was trying to, when, he, when action photography became possible, he tried to carry that over as much as he could. So he uh, consistently tried to have the engine well lit and, and nicely smoking and nicely smoking for him meant without obscuring the engine or train. He preferred some elevation and he tried wherever possible to catch the drivers down, the driving rods down, I should say. So, you know, I don't mean he got that in every shot as you'll see as we go through, but that, that's kind of, I think what was always in the back of his mind. This is train six, the Erie's uh, Lake Cities, eastbound be, behind uh, K5A Pacific 2936, kind of the, uh, you know, the top of the line in terms of the Erie uh, passenger engines. This is at uh, what the Erie in, in those days called Coldbird Junction. That's how it was appeared in the uh, employee timetables. Now, nowadays, most, most people uh, refer to this as by the Susquehanna name, Patterson Junction. And uh, the old tower that was there um, was BT, I think. Um, at the time this was taken, it was in East Patterson. And now, of course, they changed their name too. So that's uh, Elmwood Park. This is in 1947, and the, the track there on the, on the right is the connection to the uh, Susquehanna. Whoops, I hit the back button. And uh, here's 2935, this is eastbound in Waldwick. Uh, this is in commuter service toward the end of steam in 52. These, these uh, you know, engines that have been kind of the pride of the fleet got, got uh, used up their time in commuter service at the end. And that's that's what was going on here. Uh, in the distance, you see a stop that I think was just for the Waldwick employees. And the train is uh, eastbound approaching uh, WC Tower here, which of course has been restored now. Um, here, here on the Lackawanna's Booten line. This is Pacific 1138 with train 1053 on, on June 27th, 1946. Coincidentally, I, I don't know, it seems to happen to me in every presentation. I get going along and I, I have a, a lot of pictures, it seems, of 1138 in this presentation because, you know, it's a nice engine and it, it seemed to get a lot of use. So <laughs> I don't know why. I didn't do that intentionally, but you'll see. Uh, this, I think, is west of the, the Lackawanna's Pat Patterson Station, about where State Route 19 is now, and you know, just south of Interstate 80. Of course, this trackage is gone now. And here's a Lackawanna uh, 484, 1608, with a train of empty hoppers uh, getting ready to leave Port Mar Morris on the cutoff. These, of course, were called Poconos on the Lackawanna. This one has a high mounted headlight giving it a bold faced appearance. Uh, it's uh, not conventional as some of the, uh, and you know, I'll show you some more conventional looking ones as we go through this, but uh, uh, the switch on the right is uh, the leg of the Y between the cutoff and the old main line. So now, now it's just the, the teaser. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, background of my dad's personal life. I streamed like this from my earlier presentation, but I, I still, I know not everybody on on here has uh, seen this, so I'm going to go through it, try and do it quickly. My dad uh, was born by a house that uh, was actually backed up to the Susquehanna tracks. We've got a map here. It's not very good, but I don't know if you can see my arrow there. He, he was born in this house. This is a Susquehanna through Hawthorne. This is the Erie Main Line. Uh, when he was about two years old, they moved over to, over to a house about a block away that backed up to the Erie. But then when he was about four years old, they moved up to move in with his grandmother 
an aunt who were in Glen Rock up here on Glen Avenue, uh, right in the in the V between the Erie Main Line and the Erie Bergen Line. This is a uh, Wedgwood Junction here and heading on north. And then after he got married, he, and where I grew up was on West Main Street, right up against the Erie Main Line. And you'll see in a little bit, this was right in the front yard, basically. And my, you know, my dad was, you know, saw trains. The, the family story was that as a toddler, he looked out the window and watched the Susquehanna trains going by from his, uh, is a playroom window. And uh, it, uh, you know, soon after that, when he moved to Glen Rock, he had toy trains in the basement there. And, uh, you know, he just was enamored with trains from a very early age. His grandparents, uh, paternal grandparents, and other family were in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And they did a lot of frequent travel up to Allentown, but they had no, no cars or no drivers in the family. Neither of his parents, my dad's parents, my grandparents ever drove. So everywhere they went was by train. And they, I think they, you know, went every couple of weeks whenever they could. So he went back and forth by train to, to Allentown frequently. And here he's getting bigger. Uh, there's a photo. Rail fans got very uh, dressed up at times uh, back then. He's standing next to an engine on the Mar Morris and Erie here. And uh, I guess that's sort of a school outfit. He uh, started taking pictures with a bar borrowed box cameras initially in the, around 1930. He went to Stevens Tech in Hoboken where he commuted on the Erie. He collected the tickets from his commutation and the other uh, students on the train that saw, saw he was doing that started giving them all his tickets. So I've got boxes and boxes full of tickets in my basement that he collected from uh, everybody on the train while I was commuting at times. He uh, got interested in uh, his cousin Margie's friend Marie in Allentown and uh, got pretty serious, but you know he was kind of a cool guy. His courting idea was romantic walks by the tracks. And uh, that's what he did. But he went to Allentown a lot for that reason as well. So a lot of, so he did end up taking a lot of photographs in Eastern Pennsylvania because of the, the tie up there. He got a BS in mechanical engineering in 1938 from, from Stevens. Um, Marie and Don got married in 1942. They uh, had a new house, a new home by the uh, tracks in Glen Rock, right by the main line. They almost lived in Hohokus, but that deal ran through, fell through, and you know they they were very happy with the way this worked out. Though my dad was having quite a correspondence with Trains Magazine in those early years. Uh, he really liked trains compared to the railroad magazine because of the reproduction quality. And uh, he, uh, you know, I he had a letter where he wrote to Al Comback, just kind of not about trains, but just bragging about his new new home by the tracks. So they were pretty excited. Uh, during World War II, Don, my dad tested uh, Curtis Wright engines for he had a deferment for defense purposes, and he worked for Curtis Wright mostly in Fairfield, testing uh, airplane engines. After the war, of course, all those jobs went away and he worked for a while. He was trying to find engineering work, but he, he worked as an extra board operator in the Erie uh, for several years. Uh, and he qualified, I believe, in all the towers between, uh, I think, uh, HX at Hackensack and uh, Hackensack Drawbridge and uh, Newburgh Junction, I believe worked quite a bit at Suffered, I think. And, uh, you know, he, he had a couple other jobs in that period, but in 1952, he kind of stabilized with Continental Can Company in Patterson, and he basically worked there the, the rest of his working life as a plant engineering manager. He got his first car in 1939, uh, which he called Lizzie, you know, I guess the Fords were tin Lizzie's. And uh, he always referred to his cars. He always gave him a name, but this was Lizzie. 
The first year he got her, he drove over 40,000 miles and uh, mostly chasing trains and going to see my mother in Allentown. And he kept the car for another 10 years. This is, I think, in 1949. That's uh, me peeking out in the back seat, my sister in the driver's seat, my, my mother's in the, in the front seat there. I'm not positive, but I think this is up near Craigville along the Lehigh and Hudson. That was kind of a very very common uh, Sunday afternoon drive, probably between trains there. He was taking a, taking a photo. Here's the last of this series on the, on the family, uh, pretty much. Um, David Maney has shared this one with me at, on the left. It's Cascade Y on the Delaware and Hudson, but it kind of shows my relationship with, uh, with all this. Uh, behind my dad there. Uh, he's talking to the engineer. He's probably trying to arrange uh, either a cab ride, which I know he had uh, a couple times there or possibly uh, smoke at some particular spot. I don't really know, but uh, he, he liked to talk to engineers like that. On the upper uh, right is a photo of my dad, just a portrait shot. That, that's when he was in his around 40 years old, his midlife uh, picture. And then in the uh, lower right is a uh, 50th wedding anniversary shot. That's in uh, 1992 at my house in Sparta, New Jersey at that time. Um, my dad passed away in, in October of 94. So now I'm going to have a few slides. I, I used these before too, but... I'm going to do these very quickly and, and not, not get into details, but uh, just kind of show the different cameras my dad used over the years and how his photography kind of progressed in terms of the technical side. Uh, started out in the, in the 30s, he used a variety of box cameras. At the same time, he, he also, you'll see in a minute, got into larger cameras, but he sometimes still used the, the box camera as the small camera when he wasn't carrying the big camera. Um, this is one I, I leave in for, for Richie, uh, special affection for the Rahway Valley. Um, this is in 1938, I believe, at, in Kenilworth. Uh, you really love, the, love those uh, awnings. My dad was there several times. He, he got engine photos. I'm not sure that he got anything good in terms of action shots. So, you know, he was there mostly on the weekend and he, he didn't seem to find action too, too often, but uh, he did get some good shots. And this one was with his eight by 10 view camera, which you can see on the left, he set up with that. This is when he was really trying to per perfect uh, his technique and results with uh, engine portraits, which is what you know most people were trying to do in the mid thirties. Uh, he, um, you know, got a view camera, was manufactured by the, the Wall and Sack Camera Company, company in, in Rochester. And uh, it was a, a big thing to, to carry around and set up, but he was a big guy. So he, uh, he uh, liked doing it. This, uh, Example is uh, uh, at the uh, calling tower in Port Morris, with Pacific uh, 1114. Uh, you can see the call hoppers in the upper left for dumping. I forget I, I mentioned they, that where he set up with the camera on the left there is the is the roundhouse in North Hawthorne on the Susquehanna. I'm not sure who took those pictures. It might have been his father, but uh, not sure. Uh, during the during the 30s, uh, he also you know transitioned to the postcard size. Uh, his his first step up was a camera, an Ehrnman from Germany. That was mostly for engine portraits. Uh, when he either before he took the eight by tens or when it was too big to to transport the uh, it was too hard to transport the eight by ten. Later in the 30s, he bought another postcard camera, a compact Graflex model with a focal plane shutter. And of course, that was kind of the key to uh, catching action. Those were relatively new 
in, at that time and uh, it enabled him to stop stop the action for action photography, which you know became kind of you know his thing. This example is uh, two Jersey Central westbounds uh, approaching Communipaw Avenue in Jersey City in 1939. The Camelback on the right is headed to the Atlantic Highlands at the Jersey Shore, and the Pacific is headed uh, for Mock Chunk, of course, now Jim Thorpe. And of course, I always like to point out that he's standing on the eastbound main and the signal is a clear. So you could uh, access was a lot easier in those days. Then his, his next move was to go to a four by five uh, speed graphic. He wanted the larger action shots and then, then he could get with the uh, graph compact graph like so and he still believed the sharpest possible focus could be obtained by by avoiding use of an enlarger. He had an enlarger, but it wasn't a very good one. So that, that's where he formed his opinion, I guess. He bought a four by five size. Uh, this is his first new camera, an anniversary speed graphic. Uh, of course, it wasn't like cameras today. It used individual film holders that you had to load, and usually you only got one chance for an exposure for an action shot. But it, uh, you know, could take pretty good pictures. He uh, didn't use it for too many years, though. He he felt it was a little bit squarish uh, when he to compose a shot when he when he was dealing with longer trains. That's why he, you'll see it in a second, he went to the five by seven side. This sample is a 1940 eastbound Lagoana local on the Sussex branch uh, at Andover, near Andover. So here's the uh, five by seven speed graphic he used basically for the rest of the US uh, regular steam era. Uh, most of his peers thought this size was a little too large to handle, but again, he was a big guy and it suited him well. This is, I, I always show just because it's the first shot with the camera when it was new to him. This was, uh, I believe, also one of the times my mother was walking the tracks with him on a date. The train is uh, Lehigh Valley's John Wilkes with Streamline Pacific 2102. It's eastbound in 1941 at Bloomsbury, New Jersey. So now I'm gonna, you know, really get back into the, just the photo gallery. Um, the way I've organized this is as much as possible geographically. I'm gonna give you a trip from Jersey City to Port Jervis with a number of stops along the way. It's just the way I reshuffle the deck this time. So to start, here's, a, here's an oldie from 1940, it's K4B Pacific 2749, departing from uh, Erie's Pavonia Terminal in Jersey City. This is train 27. That, uh, over the left, that Union Terminal Cold Storage Company building uh, is on 12th Street. It's close to where the Holland Tunnel Toll Plaza was until recently, when I guess they now eliminated the tolls. But uh, it's very close to the entrance, just, just south of the entrance to the Holland Tunnel. And, or Pavonia, this is just the Pavonia terminal is right, right, right at the rear of the train there. And this uh, is moving out uh, two trains departing Jersey City. Uh, closest one is behind K4 Pacific 2715. Boy, it's quiet out here where you're doing these presentations. I can't tell whether the audience is uh, awake or not, but. Uh, I'm, it's my first ever Zoom presentation, so I'm getting used to it. Um, that uh, building on the on the right, on, on the left is one of the approaches, the old approach to the, to the Holland Tunnel. And, and on the uh, left, or excuse me, on the right, that large rectangular building was owned by the S.B. Pennick and Company, a manufacturer of plant-based pharmaceuticals. I, I know that just because you could read it on the side of the building when you when you blow it up a little bit. And that building, I believe, still stands. At least it still shows on, on Google Maps. Uh, I think it's just used as a warehouse now. Uh, Interstate 78 cuts right through here now, near where the trains, trains are in the photo, roughly perpendicular to the tracks, the extension of the, of the turnpike. 
to the left of the elevated right away are freight tracks that are at street level. And those came out of Bergen Tunnel. It was really kind of amazing infrastructure down there with uh, the passenger trains, tra trains that went through the archway uh, running on top of the freight tracks that, that went through the tunnel. It was kind of a, a double deck railroad for about a mile through there. Here's another train just moving a little further along there. Um, you know, it's nice. Notice the air conditioning and the still, still well, coaches down below there and the, the train in the foreground. Uh, here's a train that's uh, actually heading into the the uh, Bergen Arches, just just a few feet further ahead, and you can still see the uh, SB Pennant Company building back, looking through the through the arches there. The last trains through here ran in, in 1957, and uh, you know since then it's been just basically arches area just been sitting there. Uh, unused, but there's been a lot of uh, plans over the years and proposals for subsequent use. And I, I guess now they're trying to turn it into a some kind of multi-use greenway trail. But as far as I know, it's just kind of a weedy canyon at the moment there. Now, uh, out in the meadows, uh, here's Pacific 2716 drifting down from the Hackensack River Bridge. The uh, freight leads of, out of Croxton Yard are on the right. And uh, this is where the uh, Harvin, Harmon Cove apartment, <laughs> getting tongue twisted, the Harmon Cove apartment complex is uh, now. And of course, now the, uh, the uh, passenger tracks, you know, veer off to the uh, left in this photo and head over to Secaucus Junction. But of course, they didn't do that this time. Here's a Pacific 2552 with a westbound train. Uh, this is train 20, 123 at uh, the Hackensack River drawbridge uh, HX tower. And my dad is uh, shooting from the tower here. It's this August uh, 2nd, 1951. This is again an, an older one. This is 1940. It's a uh, westbound advanced uh, 87 freight with uh, K4B 2750. It's at, at Coldberg Junction again in uh, what was then East Patterson. And I think that's the BT Tower at the, at the right. Uh, that one didn't last very much longer. It didn't, didn't last after the war. But it was, I think it was run remote from Ridgewood Junction uh, later. But uh, it's interesting that the Erie Pacifics are pretty versatile too. You'll, you'll see these on freight trains and passenger trains. Uh, I've got several examples of that in the, in the talk tonight. This is a westbound commuter train uh, passing the ball, a ball game at Daly Field in the Radbird section of Fairlawn. It's kind of like the ball game shot. This is, um, now we're getting to the hometown of Glen Rock, uh, where of course my dad took lots of shots. This is uh, an eastbound freight uh, behind uh, Berkshire 3357. It's beyond Harristown Road on the Bergen County line in uh, um, 1946. These were, uh, you know, really my dad's favorite fre freight engines, I think. Uh, not just on the Erie, but probably anywhere. This is a K4 24, no, 2745 with train 27 in 1945. This is running on the Bergen County line past the, this is the distance signal for Ridgewood, Ridgewood Junction. Uh, so it's approaching Harristown Road in Glen Rock. Now, 
probably the spot my dad used most frequently of any. This is this is uh, about a thousand feet from home, opposite the end of Ferndale Avenue on the main line. This is train number one, the Erie Limited. And this is with engineer Rutherford Bill Smith, who became my dad's uh, friend. He's running uh, K5A Pacific 2935, it's 1946. Because the uh, trains, the tracks turn slightly towards the east in this area, it was one of the best locations in New Jersey for capturing number one with any uh, sunlight on the front of the engine. But for my dad, you know, just pretty much any day he was home, he just strolled down there. So there's probably, uh, you know, 40 different shots at least in the collection at, at this spot. This I uh, just show a little personal side with uh, Bill Smith. He was he was known by several names. My dad and most of his friends regularly called him Smitty, and the rare on the railroad he was known uh, as uh, Rutherford Bill Smith. Uh, Rutherford was a reference to where he had grown up in in Rutherford, New Jersey. Um, probably to avoid some confusion with other Smiths on the railroad. In, uh, some, in my previous presentation, I had several slides about how my dad met Smitty, but I cut those out this time in the interest of time. This is Smitty and his wife, Roberta, uh, together there next to uh, Smitty's car. They took my parents on excursions to Harriman Park in New York State. Uh, this is up near the Bear Mountain Bridge I, by Perkins Drive, I think. Uh, there's, their son, Ralph, was a park naturalist up there. Here's my... Uh, mother waving to Smitty from the front yard at the house in Glen Rock. And obviously, I guess staged, but this was still basically a daily occurrence. Um, he finished, Smitty finished his morning run on the, on the Erie Limited in Port Jervis and laid over for a couple hours and, and came back on train 28. So he passed the house here in Glen Rock again about 5 p.m., which, which is what you're looking at here. Uh, that's, that's Smitty waving to my mother. Here's Smitty again, passing right in front of the uh, my parents my parents' home. On, this is on train train 28 on uh, in June of 1942. This is actually the month they got married. Here's Smitty again with uh, 28. Uh, here he's passing the Leone Lumber Company, approaching Glen Rock and the Glen Rock Mainline Station in 1946. I, uh, you know, remember vividly when I was a kid in, in '56, there was a big fire here. The lumber yard was basically destroyed. There were hoses all over the tracks, and it, uh, you know, trains were disrupted for quite a few hours. Here's Pacific 2940 with the Lake Cities uh, eastbound at Ridgewood Junction in, in 1946. It's passing WJ Tower to the right there. Okay. And of course, we're, we're moving on up the line here. Was, the trains are coming at us in many cases. We're not, we're not chasing all the time, but uh, you know, I'm trying to show you all along the line as, as much as I can here. This is a rear view of the Erie Limited. This is a very, very early small negative in uh, around 1933. It's actually negative number 60 in my dad's filing system. He took some, some early negatives that he didn't bother to file, but uh, this, by the time he got around to creating a system, this was number 60, so it's very early. He rarely took such views. I mean, I wish he would have taken more variety, but, uh, um, you know, film film was a significant expense, and he he saved his film, you, you know, usually for the for the head end. Um, little story about this shot. I, in my teenage years, I uh, did dark darkroom work for my dad. He he didn't like to do darkroom work much, so I he hired me to do it at times. I remember a big search for this one. He was in correspondence with William Cratville, Bill Cratville who um, was looking for shots for his uh, acclaimed book uh, came out in 1967, Steam, Steel, and Limiteds. 
And my dad had a number of photos in that book, but he, he, he and you know, good, good head ends, but he was also looking for the, the rear ends. And uh, my dad didn't have many, but he remembered this one, but we had trouble finding it. Uh, but we did. Some of you know his daughter, Kate Cratfill, who is uh, married now to Trains Magazine uh, editor, Jim Wren. My wife accused me of name dropping when I put that in the script, but I, they're good people. Now, Hohokus, uh, here's uh, 2745 in 1946 with train 67. The distant uh, signal for Ridgewood Junction is there to the right. This is, uh, yeah, it's tra train 67, so westbound. Now we're getting to Waldwick. It's a 1952 shot, K4-2725 uh, with train 119. This is entering the first curve of the, you know, of course the well-known S-curve is working up to here, but this is the first part of the S-curve. Um, my dad probably spent more time in Waldwick than anywhere other than Glen Rock. So I'm gonna include several views there. Of course, it was a, it was a terminal for many of the, you know, commuter trains and there was a lot of activity, four track main line, uh, it was a good place to go. Uh, this is just about a car length further west on the same curve. It's uh, 2935 with train 129. Uh, this again is uh, June 9th, this is June 9th, 1952, very late for these engines, which is why they were, had been you know, downgraded to com commuter service here. That's the the uh, distant signal for, for Waldwick WC Tower now. Dave uh, Maney was with it, my dad this day and took a color shot. Uh, and he remembers that there was quite a bit of urgency in photographing the K5As then uh, just because they were on their on their last miles then. Now this is into the second part of the curve. So you can start, you can see the S here. Berkshire uh, 3380 with 106 cars in uh, 1947. And train 12 is just disappearing to the right. Here's the more traditional uh, Waldwick view. I, I've used this one before, but you know, I like it because of the snow and all. And, uh, I like it because uh, this is Valentine's Day, uh, 1943, in the middle of World War II. So, you know, I get to say, let's hope my mo my mom at least got a card. The uh, you know some groups and publications have talked about this and called it Collins Curve, after um, my dad's good friend and I called him Uncle Bob, Bob Collins. But uh, my dad my dad went there with Bob a lot, but he also went there without Bob. But uh, this was, was very a uh, place where a lot of people congregated because obviously it was a good view there. And here we're moving further uh, west. Um, Pacific 7, 2747 with a 15 car string of still wells. There you see WC Tower uh, visible behind the, the home signal on the right. Here's an eastbound. This is actually, I don't know if you remember, in my introduction, I showed a commuter train in Waldwick. It was just a little bit further west than this one. It didn't show the signal, but this is pretty much the same spot. Um, again, there's quite a few of these shots. I, I just can't imagine commuting this way. It's just amazing. Uh, moving further west from, from Waldwick into Allendale, by the second coach is a crossing. My, my dad always called this Swan's Crossing. I, I was talking with Dave Maney last week and uh, he didn't recognize that name. I'm not sure now whether my dad was the only one that called it Swan's Crossing, 
I, I did look it up on some historical records in Allendale. I mean, I, I think it was a real name of a guy who, you know, was a landowner and a possible crossing watchman there. But uh, apparently that term, you know, has, hasn't carried over to the present day, perhaps. I, I'm not sure. If, if anybody knows, you can please comment. The, uh, it's where Chestnut Street, though, crosses the railroad. Uh, this was June 6, 1952, train 129. The Waldwick coach yard is behind the train here. This is uh, uh, train 27 with Pacific 2747, uh, also in Allendale. You can see mile post Jersey City 25 there to the far left. The uh, Allendale station is just behind the train here. This is Berkshire uh, 3365 with an eastbound freight. It's train 74. They, you know, the freight trains were many of them numbered then. To the right in the distance, the uh, Route 17 bridge is, is visible. It's pretty far back, but you can see it, I think. Um, of course, that's a present day station site for New Jersey Transit. There's a four by five negative from 1940, a, a shot in Mawa of uh, the third section of train 98 behind uh, Berkshire 3355. It's 101 cars. Nice ballast, ballasted right away there. We're into New York State now. This is an eastbound departing suffering in June of 49. K1 Pacific 2541 with a, a local commute, local train. SF Tower suffering is just in the distance around the bend there, but you can't quite see it here. Of course, in the present day, the uh, New York State Thruway cuts through the rear against the mountain in the background there. The 17 car eastbound freight on the main line is heading to the Piermont branch. Uh, it's again a Pacific uh, on these, this train. It's 2733. This is at Hillburn, just crossing the, uh, there's a bridge over the Ramapo River. Um, these cars were just picked up from the middle track at Ramapo, which you'll see us in a minute. Uh, the bridge is, well, I said that, the bridge is, reading my notes, the bridge is red, uh, um, covered the uh, Ramapo, across the Ramapo River here which of course the railroad follows for the, the next uh, more than 10 miles. Here's a shot in Ramapo. You can see the, the middle track was the siding here, just, just beginning here. The river, the Ramapo River is in the background. An N2 Mike uh, 3212, which is one of the regulars in that area. The, uh, this train is actually very close to approaching Sterlington Station, which was not a, not a station stop anymore, but it was the site of a very disastrous head-on wreck in August 1958, uh, where five railroad uh, crewmen died, including uh, a good friend of my dad's engineer, Sammy uh, Nardo, who was a, grew up next door to my dad. He's, he's younger, but... Uh, Next door neighbor, um, you know, I, we visited the site after the crash. I never forget that one. There's another four by five from uh, 1940. You know, you notice there's a, there's a lot in 1940 and then there's a, there's a lot in 1946 not as many during the war because everybody was awful busy and it was also you could get in trouble if you weren't, you know, if you weren't known uh, taking pictures during the war. This is a uh, westbound freight at Slotsburg. Um, 
this is actually of all the Berkshires we've seen so far, this is the first in the S1 class. The others have all been S3s. Erie had a total of 105 Berkshires. The largest class was the S3s. They had 35 of those. The S1s were built by Alco Brooks out in Dunkirk, New York, which was an online location for the Erie. Uh, Baldwin built the uh, 35 S3s. The uh, S3, S1s and S3s were common in the, on the New York and Delaware divisions. There were S2s and S4s as well, but those were built by Lima in Ohio, and, and the Erie generally kept them west of Hornell, I guess, you know, close to the builder if there were any problems. On the, there were a few occasions when one of the Lima engines came east. I, I didn't pull any photos of that for this, but I know when that happened, there was a, that was an exciting big deal for the local fans. This is an eastbound freight in July 45 with uh, S1 3324 at uh, mile post JC 38 is off to the right there. It's a little less than a mile west of Tuxedo Station. The second car is, is, a, is a bridge crossing the Ramapo River again. Obviously, the river is getting smaller up here. Some of the places, like back at uh, Ramapo, where it looked real wide, it, it was dammed up in some of those sections. But anyway, this is a, there are multiple crossings of the Ramapo River. This is um, uh, Southfields, the second section of train 90, Berkshire 3355. Route 17 is right behind the train here. Um, this was an unusually low level angle for my dad who normally sought higher elevations. This would have been referred to as doing a Lemosina by my dad if he was, you know, talking to Bob or, or other friends. And that was just sort of a, a, a joke. Uh, Lemosina was a, was a friend, he, Robert A. Lemosina, who started out in the New York, New Jersey area, but moved to Colorado and he was known for, uh, you know, favoring this angle, at least in his early years. And he uh, subsequently relocated to Colorado where he became quite well known as a railroad photographer and author. But uh, anyway, this is a Lemosina. This is Arden, another of my dad's uh, favorite spots, took quite a few here. This is the Erie Limited again, train one, same old story, Bill Smith running again and, and running fast here. This is uh, 1947 in Arden. This was a station for, at one point for the Harriman family estate and the siding behind the station was actually uh, intended originally for their private cars. Uh, the houses to the right are on Route 17 and uh, the New York Thruway would be really close by on the, on the left now. Totally, totally different there than it looks there. It looks totally different there than it is than it was then. And moving uh, further west, north uh, compass wise, this is um, westbound freight crossing the Woodbury Viaduct. Uh, it's another S1 Berkshire, 3323. Route 32 passes uh, beneath here. The first section of train 98 crossing Moodna Viaduct uh, in uh, Salisbury Mills. Uh, this is uh, 92 cars behind uh, S3-3371. This is February 1941. My dad didn't take too many pictures on the, the viaduct. I, I remember Scott Lotus, you know, saying, uh, wonder why he doesn't have more pictures on Starucca viaduct. Well, I, I, I think, you know, he had pictures right up the road at the spot where the engines were working uh, usually going across the bridges, he, they didn't get good smoke. And that's, I think, what kept him from uh, doing it often. But it worked out good this day. This is Campbell Hall, as you can see the sign on the, uh, on the right. Uh, 3353 with a freight uh, in 1946. Appears to be a string of reefers here, I think, uh, on this one.
This is what my dad called Michigan Corners. Uh, it's east of the present day Middletown Station on, on the Graham line, of course. This is an S1 uh, Berkshire with a westbound freight that originated in Maybrook. This is in August 42. The, uh, Actually, I got confused there. That was Stony Ford, that, this last one. Yeah, that, that's Stony Ford, 93 cars behind uh, 89. And this is Michigan Corners, uh, just a little further west, but still east of the present Middletown, Middletown Station. This, this is the train that originated in Maybrook. The, uh, of course, then they had the lower, these lower quadrant uh, semaphores, which are different. Now this one is uh, westbound still on the Graham line, but this is uh, west of the present Middletown station. This is another favorite of mine. I've showed this one before, but I, I just like it. That is the, the O and W, the New York, Ontario and Western crossing in the background there, the, the bridge. And then you can see there right away, uh, heading off to the left there. Now here, I thought maybe it'd be helpful to have a, have a map for a minute. I, this area around Howells is confused. It was confusing to me. I'm just learning about it some. So I just wanted to, I thought maybe it'd be confusing for other people too, in some cases. But um, what we're not following today is this is the, the old original main line where the passenger trains went uh, in the 40s and early 50s. And I don't know if you can see my pointer there. This, they, the freight, this is the Graham line here, Campbell Hall. So the photos we just looked at are out in this area. And uh, the two lines came together in Howell. And I'm gonna show you some photos there in a minute. But, the, but they, they came together, but they were still operated pretty much separately. And the old Erie line went out here to Otisville, didn't go through the tunnel, went up higher than where the tunnel is today, went down this way. And they finally, finally got together with the Graham line down here at FX Tower, which was originally called Guymard, and then later called Graham. So this is the passenger line, and this is the freight line. And I'm gonna show you a couple photos here, but I just kind of wanted to orient a little bit. Later on, I think in 54, they cut off the passenger line west of Howell. So this was out, and at that time, then all the passenger trains went on the Graham line through the tunnel. But um, of course, eventually now they, they cut this line out completely, but that didn't happen until the 70s. So uh, quite a few changes over the years here. So now with that orientation, I'll show you here's, this is Howells Junction. Uh, the uh, westbound freight from Maybrook behind 3356, the two tracks on the left of the old main line. Now here, now this one is, I was confused about this when I first saw it. I, and I'm pretty sure nobody's seen this one before. Um, this is uh, actually turns out to be on the old passenger line between Middletown and Howells. See my dad just, his notes just labeled everything as Howells. And when I started to, you know, look at them further, I wanted to be, I prefer to figure out exactly where it was. So this took a little research. I got a little help from uh, Joe Barbario, who, or Doug Barbario, excuse me, who um, did a presentation in this area recently for the o and group. And uh, this is what they call Middletown Summit in the back here. And, there's, and uh, so this is, I think it's, um, this is about halfway between Middletown and Howells. And you can see the dip here following Middletown Summit. There was also a bridge in the background that was an old trolley bridge and there's a water tank there. So that's what we're looking at here. 
This was train 255, which also confused me when I first saw it, because when you look at a timetable anytime after 1947, 255 is a train that terminates, terminates in, in Suffern. But then I, you know, dug out some earlier information and, you know, back in uh, 1945, when this was taken, that train went all the way to Port Jervis. And at some time between then and 47, it was cut back to Suffern. So here's actually, this is the same train, different day, obviously different engine, but this is coming right into Howells Junction now, again, on the passenger line. Um, there were some crossovers there, and I'm not sure of the whole history. Somebody else listening probably knows. I, I think originally there was a tower here and there were probably actually crossovers, but then in the 40s and 50s, it seems to have just been some manual switches there and under normal operation, unless it was an emergency or something, they didn't didn't cross over there uh, with any of the through trains. But you can see where the passenger train's coming in from, in from the uh, right side here, and this is the Graham line. And, you know, this is looking back to the, to the east. And this is actually the same day, my dad waited around there. He, I guess the last shot he was standing up here on the, on the bridge here, which is Bowser Road. And uh, this is train 27. Those trains were actually pretty close together. But um, um, this is, like I said, it's the same day as the last shot. And now this one, I've shown this one before too, because I, I really I really like it. But when I started to work on this presentation, I it suddenly, and I was looking at all these other Howell shots, I, I realized I don't even know exactly where this shot is. And I still don't. I think it's a, it's a couple, within a mile or two west of Howell's on the passenger line. Otherwise, if it was any further than that, my dad probably would have called it Otisville. But, I, and I haven't exhaustively looked, but uh, on current Google Maps, of course, everything is totally overgrown with foliage. I kept looking at these rock walls to the uh, left there. I figured those might still be around, you know, uh, but I can't see it from the air. So I wanted to throw this up. If anybody knows where this spot is, please comment because, you know, I could stop working on it. I, I don't know if you can see there, but I'm going to give you a little blow up here. This, this is, is Smitty again. Um, and uh, I gave you a blow up here. It's funny how Smitty's uh, leaning out to the left there. Um, and uh, makes you think that it was possibly uh, smoked by prearrangement. Maybe he was expecting my dad and, and spotted him from the cab and ran over here. I, you know, it makes you wonder if anybody's really uh, sitting in the engineer seat at this point, but uh, I don't know, maybe there was somebody else there he, he turned it over to. But anyway, that's that's uh, Smitty giving a look out the out the window there, I think. This is another one that uh, when I first started presenting this, I mean, you know, a lot of you guys listening are smarter than I am, but uh, this was sort of less familiar territory for me. When I first looked at I pulled this out, I said, gee, it's afraid it must be on the gram line. Well, turns out I'm convinced it's not on the Graham line now. I, you know, I started looking closer, a couple hints. You, I don't know if you can see right behind the engine, there's a caboose, which suggests it's probably some kind of a pickup or what they called an ordinary freight. And uh, when I looked further back, magnifying on the far right there, I see a whistle post. Well, you know, remember that the Graham line was built with no grade crossings at all. It was a low grade line. so. Uh, you know, this couldn't be the, the Graham line. Well, then I did some more research and it, it appears that this one is on the passenger line uh, west of Otisville. I think that's uh, Route 211 on the left there, but it's, it's since been kind of widened and relocated slightly. Of course, the railroad's not there now, but when you look on Google views right in the area there, you can you can see those same kind of cliffs, so I'm pretty sure that's where it is. That'd be so. It's almost right up on top of the west portal of uh, Otisville Tunnel, 
just slightly, slightly ge geographically south of that point, but only, you know, quarter of a mile or something like that. But I liked it. Now this is going down the hill on the other side. Um, this is uh, a westbound freight with 70 cars west of Otisville on the, on the Graham line. It's April 1946. This shot was taken from a Route 211 bridge that's in that area. This is a darkly dramatic view. Uh, this is, goes back to 1942. It's upgrade eastbound from Port Jervis in the area near Black Rock Cut. The S1 Berkshire 3322 leading, and in the distance is a smoke visible from a 210O that was a pusher, a 4218. Working hard through there. This is train nine approaching Port Jervis in 1940 uh, with the view opening up towards the Never Sink uh, River Valley. Not all my dad's downhill shots had smoke, but I, I tend to, to pick out the ones that did. I guess those are milk cars there, right? Here's Berkshire uh, 3360 getting out of Port Jervis with an eastbound freight the same day as the previous shot. The train is the fourth section of 98. There's an N2 Mike uh, 3209 was pushing here. Now here's a surprise for a further presentation. You don't, you don't expect to see a diesel, but I like the, the view of the steam engines, the facilities in the background. And this is a, uh, New York, Ontario and Western FT number 601 is passing through Port Jervis. There was a rec related detour going on there. It's April 16th, 1948. It's a nice view of the, the uh, yard there. And of course you can see the, this, the uh, passenger station towards the rear of the train there. And one more on the main line. This is actually beyond Port Jervis uh, um, on the Mill, Mill Rift uh, crossing the, the Delaware River. Uh, I realized when I got to this point, I didn't have any uh, 2.10.2s in, in the presentation and I didn't want to go back and look for one. So I put this one in because this is one of my favorites. Scott has a whole collection of, he, he did a whole show on, uh, not a whole show, but a, a series of, uh, crossings here. I don't know if he's got that tonight to show, but uh, uh, for the book, he, he kind of looked at all the rejects and they made a good show. Um, these engines were crossing the Delaware River at Mill Rift. Uh, it was a train of empty hoppers that bound for uh, Avoca. They, you know, pick up more anthracite. These, these engines worked mostly drag freights and served as pushers out of Port Jervis, but they did run to New Jersey occasionally. That relatively uncommon, but there are some photos of them down in, in New Jersey. These, of course, generally called Santa Fe types. I, I'm not sure. Maybe somebody can comment on this. I don't know if the Erie called them Santa Fe's or not, but this is what would be normally called a Santa Fe type. So that's it for the trip from. Jersey City to Port Jervis. Now I'm shifting over to a few Erie branch line photos. I better glance at the clock and see how I'm doing. I guess I'm got a bit. It's 8:30. My wife says that's not too bad. It's funny. I'm not used to this. Uh, the uh, Zoom presentation, so you you can't hear any, anything coming back at you. So I hope you're all there. You're doing you're doing great, Alan. Yeah, thanks, Richie. Uh, here we've got uh, going to switch a little bit, just a little sampling of very railroad branch lines. Again, I I've showed this shot before. I think we've got this in the book too, but I like this one. It's a very old one. Um, it's the Erie's uh, North Branch, the North North City Station. 
Um, this yeah, this is about 1932, I think. In fact, when my dad started his filing system, this was negative number five. Yeah, Alan, you're doing great. You're getting a lot of great responses. And that shot with the stone wall, somebody commented a shoddy hollow road. So we'll look at that. Uh, oh, okay, that's good. That's yeah. worth doing the show. Okay, thanks, guys. Um, so anyway, this is number five in his filing system. North Branch tank trains terminated at the lower level platforms in Patterson quite a bit, but they also came, some of them ran through to Waldwick and uh, somebody probably knows the answer to this too. I, I don't, but uh, these lasted a long time. I, I can actually, I don't know if it was this one, but I can remember them going by the house in, in Glen Rock when I was a little kid. So they, you know, they were, I think ran into around the fifties, into the, around 1950 or so, but somebody comment on that. Now this uh, technically wasn't, a branch line when the photo was taken, but this is the Carlton Hill branch, as I'm calling it. This is an eastbound local train. It's number 138 near Carlton Hill on the old main line through Passaic, which of course was, was severed uh, later on. But this is 1947. Uh, it wasn't severed till the, to the 60s when there were of course big changes in, in North Jersey railroading. And, but uh, even after they severed the, the railroad in, through Passaic, they kept running Carlton Hill trains for several years, the shuttle trains. Uh, I think at first they ran them all day and then they had you know a couple of rush hour trains. And I think they lasted until October 66. So this is could have been one of them, but it wasn't. Uh, this is a westbound Greenwood Lake branch train with uh, 2521 K1 Pacific. It's approaching East Lindsley uh, Road in Little Falls in 1950. Short um, local freight on the Greenwood Lake Branch near Midvale. I, this is crossing the uh, Wanaku River eastbound. It's Mike 3203, it's October 1950. New Jersey and New York, New York uh, branch train westbound in Oradell. This, the fencing there is uh, for the uh, Wanaku Reservoir. Well, not Wanaku, excuse me, the Oradell Reservoir. I'm still thinking Wanaku. Um, it, this is 2521 again. Coincidentally, it's the same engine as we saw, saw two slides back in Little Falls. This, this siding was removed at some point, and I think, New Jersey, again, somebody there probably, somebody listening probably knows a lot more about this than I do, but I think New Jersey Transit tried to put it back when they expanded service on the, uh, what's now the Pascack Valley line, but they uh, encountered strong NIMBY opposition, and I don't think there's a, a siding there, there yet, but there was then. This is the uh, Fairmont branch moving to now. Uh, it's Pacific 2716. Again, versatile engines. This is the same one we saw back in Secaucus earlier, but here it's, it's doing the local freight on the, on the Fairmont branch. The structures behind the train are interesting. They're, they're associated with what was originally the Union Hill Quarry in Suffern. So now, most recently, it was owned by Tilcon, but I think it's not operating anymore, and it's, uh, I think it's under some form of development right now. Although, when I look at Google Maps, I don't know if it's still standing or not, because I think there may be active. Again, somebody knows this. I don't. When you look at Google Maps, though, the, the structure in the back one, the tall one, is still there. Everything else around it is gone, but the uh, it was still standing in the current views on Google Maps, so uh, not sure if it's still there or not. This is Muncie. Uh, I actually took my wife on a side track when I, we were on our way to see my daughter up in Garrison in the Hudson Valley, and we had a little spare time. So I went trying to figure out where this spot was, and I think I figured it out now. I, my dad marked it as Muncie, but I didn't really know the territory here. But I think this is coming up right to approach uh, uh, Saddle River Road on the kind of the uh, west side of Muncie. 
it's a Sunday deadhead equipment move in 1946, carrying white flags. The cars are heavyweights, and it was a it was a, a train heading to the loading point near Camp Shanks in Orangeburg. I don't know exactly where it is, uh, whether it was in Piermont or Sparkkill, but uh, it's it's basically going to pick up troops returning from overseas, I believe. And again, I'm throwing extra details. I mean, I read some stuff online, but I don't know much about about this. I hear there's a new museum up there for Camp Shanks. Uh, Shanks was the the uh, army the largest army staging and embarkation camp used during World War II. They processed, uh, again, this is just on, online, it's gotta be right. 1.3 million service personnel, including 75% of those participating in the D-Day invasion. And uh, at the close of the war, they, there were 290,000 POWs also passed through the camp as they were sent uh, back to their native countries. And I think some POWs were actually kept there too during the war, but, uh, Apparently, there were some movements by train. I don't know whether there were a lot of movement by trains or not, I, but it uh, sounds like a lot of a lot of people moved through there. So, again, I don't. That's all I know about it at this point. I want to I want to visit this uh, little museum that's open up there, but I I looked it up. It's only open during the summer, but I have it in mind as something to do. So, if anybody, if if somebody's written a story or a book about this, uh, make a comment because I want to I want to look at it. Uh, here's the Susquehanna. I, I, I'm treating this today as a as a branch of the uh, Erie as well, because it kind of, uh, I, I, you know, it, it eventually became quasi independent. But for most of its uh, a great great part of its life, it operated under Erie control and used a lot of uh, engines. I think it had more engines labeled Erie than it did engines labeled Susquehanna. Um, this one is a uh, 460 10 wheeler 972 with a westbound train. Uh, I don't know if anybody can can, can spot this, but uh, it's Ridgefield Park in 1941. Kind of a spiffy little train. And here's another example of Susquehanna. This is a uh, Freight in 1940 approaching Rock Road in, in North Hawthorne, which Rock Road is the main road of Glen Rock too. So this is right on the, I would go by here all the time. This was, if my dad was going up to see Bob Collins or George Crum or vice versa, they would go by this crossing. And, you know, this was, a, that's, that's where this is located. Um, this is a, is a so-called Russian decapod it, and it, it's on the Susquehanna, but lettered as Erie's. These these engines were built for Russia, but never shipped overseas due to the outbreak of the outbreak of the Russian Revolution in 1917. So they they spent their whole time on the area in the Susquehanna. So that's it. Now finally, I'm going to switch to the Lackawanna. My dad took several at at this spot, which I I've shown at least one before. Um, this is in, in coming up the hill to, towards Summit. This is um, the train three, the Lackawanna Limited. It's Pocono uh, 1644. This is one that looks much more conventional than that, that bald-faced uh, one I had back in my introduction. This, um, spot is actually just about where the, the Morris and Essex today crosses the new uh, Route 24. You know, just about there, maybe a maybe a car length or two ahead of, ahead of the engine, but right in that area. And now we're going to follow a little bit on the, on the Booten branch. This is a uh, Train 1059 uh, with Pacific 1107 is passing under the Route 46 bridge in Clifton. This is July 2nd, 1946. This is um,
And something's confused in my notes here. We have a 1118 here. This is also in Clifton, just beyond the uh, Route 46 bridge. The last photo was taken, you know, about the fifth car on the train there. Um, and this is actually, uh, I think, right on top of the bridge. You see, there's, there's a bridge, what, what, what's actually a bridge abutment to the right there. I think this is right, my dad's standing right on top of the North branch that cuts under the, the uh, Booten branch at this point, or at, it did at that point. Now, of course, the trains come up the, uh, what had been the Booten branch and head up what had been the uh, North branch. But uh, anyway, that's where this one is, I think. Incidentally, that was 1118. I remember that number. I, I seem to have a lot of those in this presentation. Sorry for the pause. I'm just uh, had something goofed up in my notes here that I just want to make sure I'm on track. Uh, this is uh, back in the introduction. I also had a shot of uh, 1138 um, west of Patterson Station. On uh, that was on train 1053 on June uh, on um, the 27th of June, and uh, this photo is the same train with the same in the same engine at the same spot a day earlier on the uh, 26th. So. My dad tends to, to do that too. He would go one place and he would keep going back a couple of times till he got it right. And then he'd go someplace else. And uh, in this case, I, I just wonder, um, you know, maybe he wasn't satisfied with this one on the 26th. You know, it was, it looks pretty good to me, but the driver, the, the driving rods are not down. So he went back and nailed it the next day. And that was the shot I showed you earlier. So. Okay, um, this is another shot west of Patterson Station, the same general area. I think it's a little bit further west, uh, curving around Garrett Mountain there. You can see it's a little higher, a little more view of the city. Um, this, is, um, this is 118 again, 1118, excuse me. This is train 1055. And here's the same train, not the same engine, about a month later in total, uh, this time a specific 1121. That's uh, coming up in what's now a very popular, populated area of, of Toda, uh, right by, by Route 80 here. This is what I showed before. In the previous presentation, I think it, it, but I like it. It's an afternoon, Sunday afternoon local in 1940 at Montville. This is a semi streamlined 10 wheeler, uh, number 1011, Montville. Uh, this is Lake Apacon, of course. Um, this was, according to my dad's notes, this was actually a Phillipsburg to uh, Hoboken train. In August 1940, specific uh, 1112, and I ran out of time to do my research here. That track on the left, I, you know, I know I've heard the story before, but now I can't remember where that track went. I, somebody can probably comment on that. I, th I think there may have been a ground level station, a freight station, 
up by Landing Road, or there, there may be some other customer up there too, but that that's, you know, train climbing up, the track climbing up on the left there is interesting. Now, of course, uh, Excuse me. Um, this is now heading out the, the, the High Line, the, the Lackawanna Cutoff, uh, Pacific uh, 1117 at Lake Lackawanna in April uh, 1941 with train two, the Pocono Express. Um, I'm not sure. Again, people on listening probably know better than I do. I mean, New Jersey Transit has been talking forever about getting uh, trains running to Andover on this section, but uh, I don't think it's happening yet. Uh, but that was quite wide open there in, in uh, 1941. And again, this, this one I've showed before, but uh, with my old version of the uh, software, I can't even figure out how to make these animations, but this one's an animation, an animation that I think Scott Lotus made for me uh, for my last presentation. This is a P5 uh, three-cylinder 482 Mountain, it's number 2228. It's an eastbound freight in 1940 that just passed through Look Roseville Tunnel on the cutoff near Andover. It's the, uh, I believe that first car is a horse car. I talked about that before. The third cylinder, it was unique on these engines. Uh, it's a little hard to see, but just inside the, to the right of the more visible one in the image, the idea of the third cylinder was to get more power with less pounding on the rail, but uh, it was very difficult for maintenance and uh, it was a drawback and didn't really work out successfully. I think some of the engines were converted later. But here's the animation. You can see the, uh, uh, the third cylinder, the one that's obvious there on the left and then right next to it, there's another, another cylinder that's not not usual. Um, you know the exhaust of these engines. They you know must have been pretty uh, pretty strange. My dad took quite a few. Well, not quite. But he took at least four or five shots at this spot. But uh, it was obviously a good spot. This is uh, Pocono. Uh, 1644 passing the Johnsonburg Creamery on the cutoff with a 50 car eastbound freight in, in March of 46. The Johnsonburg station was on the north side of the tracks behind the train. Here's another three cylinder mountain 2227 with an eastbound call train on the cutoff at Blairstown in, in June of 1940. Now back to uh, my dad was still calling this Lake Apacon, but obviously it's sort of in no man's land between there and Port Morris. It's uh, just about at the tower, as you'll, you'll see for sure in a minute. Um, this is a, this is, this is the same Saturday that, that I showed the uh, Phillipsburg train a couple slides back. This is 10 wheeler, 10 wheeler uh, 1010 it's heading for Netcon and then up the Sussex branch. Here's a, another train, pretty much the same place, but now the, the view where you can see UN Tower, which, you know, sure looked pretty nice at that time. This is a, this is a 440 American type. Uh, this was a train that apparently only operated from Denver to Netcon. I, I'm not sure why it was that way, but that's what my dad's notes were indicating. And here's that 1118 I talked about having multiple shots of again. This is uh, 
coming east from Netcon. You can just see the little bit of the, the Netcon station in the in the far left there. This would, I guess, be off the bridge that was old, old original 206. Now on the uh, Sussex branch, this is a uh, Lehigh and Hudson freight near Waterloo in, in August 1941, heading to uh, Port Morris Yard. The right of way there is a road now. I think it's Continental Drive. Uh, Lackawanna, Mike 2123 is assisting Lehigh and Hudson uh, consolidation 91. This mixing of engines from two different railroads was generally uncommon back then, uh, but was a regular occurrence here. The Lehigh and Hudson operated on the Lackawanna and Sussex branch south of it from Andover to reach Port Morris Yard with trains from Maybrook. Uh, so the Lackawanna regularly supplied helpers there based on the, the union agreement that existed. My dad had some funny correspondence with Trains Magazine early on. They had apparently run some kind of a special about a place in California. I don't even remember. I was uh, Cajon Pass, maybe somewhere out there where I guess SP and Union and UP, or maybe it was Santa Fe. I'm not even sure. I've got the, to dig out the letter. But anyway, they were running trains with tra with engines from two different railroads, and my dad got you know, took a little umbrage because they had said something about that being the only place in the country, I guess, or, and he, so he wrote letters saying that, no, we're doing that here in New Jersey too. And he was trying to get him to write some special on it. I, and I'm not, I'm not sure whether it ever happened. This was very early in the early forties, but uh, he, he went back uh, quite a few times to try and catch these double headers. And this same spot, I think the same day, just coming, coming along with this cute little Sussex branch local. Be fun to ride that. And continuing up the branch, this is um, Cranberry Lake, 1941 view. It's an eastbound freight with a class F-16 consolidation, number 791. These jobs got older power, and this local was lo locomotive was built in 1908 at Alcos Connectivity. There's another one of the double headers. This one's uh, this is why they needed the uh, double headers, you know, going up the hill to Cranberry Lake from Andover. This is a uh, 1941, the uh, Mike 2115 assisting uh, Lehigh Hudson's Mike uh, 83. There's another eastbound freight on the Sussex branch with a ancient looking uh, consolidation. F-18 is number 364. I know my dad had another shot I didn't include down in Waterloo with this as well. I guess maybe he might've been following this train. Here's a view of Newton, which was interesting to me. I, I lived in Sparta for over 20 years, very close here. Of course, this was the home of Carson's publications and, you know, rail fan and railroad before they they uh, got associated with White River. And uh, I actually haven't seen too many pictures here at Newton. So I, I was happy to come up with this one. And lo and behold, it's 1118 again. Another train in the background, the water tank. I don't think there's much there now. I guess there's still part of an old freight station there, but if I remember right, but not, uh, you know, no water tank, I don't think. And now you're almost to the end here. Wake up, Scott. This is, uh, I've had this one before, but I like it. This is back on the, uh, the old, um, the old main line, the old road uh, through Hackettstown, but this was a, an officer's special of some kind in uh, 1941. Nice looking 10 wheeler, they must have spruced up for it. So that's actually, I'm going to cut it off there. I uh, want to acknowledge uh, and thank uh, a couple of people that helped me with pieces of this both this one and the, the earlier presentation that this was based on. And 
Dave Maney particularly, and Ray Barbario, Marty Feldman, Scott Lotus, and the, the staff at the center. My wife, uh, Susan as well, who, who puts up with me spending time on this. So thank you very much. And uh, oh, here's the book, which Mike was holding up before, and Scott may have something to say about that, but uh, things have worked out well from my perspective with the center. And uh, that's why, uh, you know, I, th I thought it would be good to, and Mike, Mike and I invited Scott to come talk about it a little bit. Here he is, he's probably got his own slide, but this is introdu introducing Scott. So I will stop sharing. Well, thanks, Alan, and thanks everyone for the opportunity to join you tonight and say a little bit more about our work on the Furler Collection as well as the center itself. Uh, and I know we're getting a little bit late in the evening, so I'll try, try to run through this pretty quickly. Uh, but my name is Scott Lotus. I'm president and executive director of the Center for Railroad Photography and Art. And we are a national nonprofit organization based in Madison, Wisconsin. And our mission is to preserve and present significant images of railroading. Now, we don't have a museum or gallery space of our own. And that business model has actually always served us pretty well, especially over the past year and a half. Uh, we work with partner venues to host regional and national conferences. Uh, we prepare and circulate traveling exhibitions that go to museums and galleries all over the country. Uh, we've had uh, over 20 of our shows in more than 100 different venues at this point. Uh, we also publish books like the Furler book, as well as our quarterly journal called Robert Heritage. And we maintain a growing archive of photography that now houses close to half a million images. And like you at Tri-State, we have pivoted to online programming. And most of our events are free and open to anyone who'd like to attend uh, via Zoom. You can also see our past presentations on our YouTube channel, and that is at youtube.com slash railphotoart. I'll give you my slide here again. That is youtube.com slash railphotoart, all one word. And if you want details about our upcoming programs, you can check our website, which is railphoto-art.org, or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Uh, we just had our last presentation of the year on Tuesday uh, by Kevin Keefe, one of our board members, uh, and he shared uh, a view of the railroads of Milwaukee as a, a former trains editor, the late David P. Morgan would have seen them. And we, can plan, we plan to continue these presentations in the coming year, and we also hope to return to in-person programming with our annual conversations conference, uh, now scheduled for April 8th uh, through the 10th, 2022, just north of Chicago. And we'll have details and registrations about that on our website just after the first of the year. All right, now I'm going to share just a few slides to wrap things up here tonight. So let me start my screen share. Right. So since you've been hearing about uh, one of our collections, I wanted to take a quick look back at our collecting efforts at the center. And so here I am uh, with our founder, John Gruber, at our first office. Um, this was back in 2013, not long after I moved to Madison. Uh, you can also see a little bit of our archive here, uh, if you look in the background. Um, Let's see. Yeah, there's uh, some of it up there and uh, some of it back there hiding behind the uh, recycling bin. Um, uh, and our, our earliest collections, I think, go back to 2004 uh, when John was the only person working at the center. Uh, by this point, we had already accessioned photographic material from Wallace Abbey, Leo King, Perry Frank Johnson, Samuel Breck. And at this time, a lot of our collections were actually stored at Lake Forest College uh, in Chicago, which served as a partner venue for us. Now, our growth can be a little bit abstract to comprehend uh, here, so let's just take a brief look by the numbers. And these are slides that our archivist, Adrian Evans, put together for me, and I really appreciate the chance to, to use them tonight. So here's what our collections growth looked like uh, up to 2013. Uh, even though our collections look modest in that image, you can see we actually had about 150,000 images. Uh, since then, we've taken on, in addition to the Furler collection, uh, work from Jay Parker Lamb, Robert Hadley, Victor Hand, Jim Shaughnessy, Ron Hill, uh, Jim McClellan, and several others. And we've relocated our collections as well as our staff office uh, twice since then. And this is what our collections look like now. 
just this past year, uh, we've pretty much maintained our collections at just under half a million. Uh, it looks a little bit of a flat line, and that's partly because of the pandemic. It wasn't always safe to have people uh, delivering or traveling to get collections. Um, and another reason is that we've had a, an influx of several smaller donations of just a few images in the past year, including some fine art prints. Uh, but as you'll see, that that last uh, tick there on the chart, on the chart, which goes up to 2022 and beyond, represents current commitments we've made for other collections that are going to come in in the future, uh, whether that's a couple of years down the road, uh, as with Carl Zimmerman, which will be coming to us soon, or uh, later and uh, uh, posthumously, like some of our other donors have elected to do. Uh, so not counting recently proposed collections, uh, our number will already total uh, well above 800,000 once all of these are physically transferred to the center. And this is where they stored now. Uh, in October of 2019, we relocated our collections uh, to a much larger storage space, uh, three rooms that comprise almost 1,500 square feet. And it also includes uh, some much needed preservation and security controls, including access to climate control, 24-7 uh, building security and monitoring, as well as fire suppression system. And this was a big step up from our previous uh, facilities. Uh, we also moved our staff and administrative offices to a much larger uh, location uh, in January of last year. Um, and you can see uh, several, we've already filled up one of these rooms pretty fully. We still have two more, uh, so we do have a little bit of room to grow, but we have to be somewhat strategic about that. And now I'd like to talk just briefly about our current collections workflow. This is one of our current interns, uh, Abigail Guidry, who's uh, seen here digitizing negatives from the John Gruber collection. Uh, so the first step is the donation. Uh, most of our collections come as donations uh, and potential donors uh, usually begin this process by reaching out to uh, one of our staff members or board members, either by phone or email. And uh, the donation is probably one of the most dynamic sectors of our collecting program right now. Uh, it used to be that we'd receive a couple of collection proposals uh, every few months, uh, but just in the past few weeks, we've received seven. Now, as we do still have limited space and finite resources, we do have to carefully review all of our collections on offer. Uh, we have a collections and acquisitions committee of our board of directors. Uh, they meet quarterly to review any large uh, donation offers. And if the committee makes recommendations to move forward, those then go to our board of directors for final approval. Now, assuming that we have the available staff and resources, uh, once something comes in, we immediately start processing. Uh, that's, uh, and that step is involve, uh, involves the documenting of the arrangement of the collection materials. Uh, we try to follow standard archival practice by retaining the photographer's original organizational scheme as much as possible. We then digitize materials from the collection, and we'll see a little bit more of that in a future slide. Uh, we also perform rehousing if necessary, uh, transferring images into archival safe boxes, containers, and sleeves, uh, which typically happens during the processing and digitization work. And we look for materials that have passed what's called the photographic activity test, uh, which is an accelerated aging test that screens various st storage products for their chemical reactivity with different photographic processes. And we also try to look for any particularly vulnerable photographic formats at this time. Um, nitrate negatives all are, are certainly a challenge there, as well as uh, older acetate negatives that might be giving off a uh, vinegar smell uh, that is a sign of, of advanced deterioration. Uh, retention is the next phase, and that's when we actually uh, get our, our materials into storage at our archival facility, and we try to maintain a stable environment of about 65 degrees Fahrenheit uh, with regulated humidity using a commercial dehumidifier. And then the last part is access. So once uh, we've done all of this other work to get the, the collection processed, housed, and stored, we try to provide access to the collection materials uh, either online or in person. Uh, we provide research assistance and fill image requests via phone and email. Uh, we post finding aids for each collection on our website. And we also share selected images from the process collections over our website and Flickr page and through our social media channels. And we're in the process of uh, preparing a uh, to start onboarding a new collection management system, which we hope to bring online next year to enable better digital access to our collections with better search operators, as well as cataloging and indexing. So we're excited about that to be moving forward. But let's look a little bit more at some of our recent processing work. Uh, another name I'm sure that's familiar to a lot of you in the Northeast, uh, in the fall of 2019, we received the collection of Jim Shaughnessy. 
uh, clearly one of the luminaries of railroad photography. And here you can see uh, the collection as it was delivered uh, by Jeff Browse, one of our board members on the left, uh, with uh, myself there on the right, and then uh, in between Jeff and me, uh, Adrian, our archives manager, uh, and uh, Haley Page, our exhibitions and events coordinator. Uh, Jeff drove everything in from New York, and uh, the four of us unloaded it and put it on all the shelves there on the left in those uh, archival bankers boxes. In the following months, we surveyed the content of this collection, and we found several glass plate negatives, about 300 of them, uh, as well as film negatives, slides, prints, and some manuscript materials. And we began uh, processing with the film negatives uh, and color slides, uh, the two formats in the collection most vulnerable to deterioration. And we learned that the negatives were roughly arranged by railroad uh, with some deviations. And we decided to follow this schema uh, and continue the process of organization alphabetically by railroads. Uh, Adrian conducted much of this work and one of our interns followed suit with the slides in the collection. And so for Shaughnessy, we started digitization and rehousing in February of 2020, uh, right before the pandemic hit, but we were able to get through all of the glass plate negatives then, which was uh, a really good start. And we, we did have to pause our archival work uh, in the early months of the pandemic, but we've since returned to in-office work on a, first on a limited basis and now on a much fuller basis. And we've, we're well into digitizing the film negatives now. Uh, we've done over 10,000 of them so far. Uh, and we're also rehousing every single one of them into these uh, four flat paper, uh, paper uh, envelopes. And this is a multi-year project that's gonna continue well into the future. And another very large collection arrived last summer, uh, the collection of our founder, John Gruber. Uh, it comprises about 111,000 negative slides and prints, as well as manuscript and research materials. And we were really fortunate to have a jump start on this big project, uh, thanks to John's widow, Bonnie, who did an initial survey and a lot of organization and arrangement work so that we could really hit the ground running with digitizing this collection. Uh, we owe both her and uh, Dick, who you see in the middle and right images there, a big debt of gratitude for, for their help in getting this collection to us and helping us get started on it. Uh, but we've, uh, since the fall of 2020, we've had two interns uh, doing digitization work on this. And I already showed you Abigail, who's working on the negatives. And she and her predecessor have already digitized more than 15,000 of them. Now, when we think about the size of these large collections, we opt to digitize them using a Nikon D800 DSLR fitted with a 60 millimeter macro lens. Uh, because shooting is much faster than scanning and through some tests we found it can produce really comparable high resolution image results. And you can see in, in these images that show a former intern, uh, Angel Tang, uh, doing digitization work with the camera on a copy stand suspended above a light table. We have a special film holder for 35 millimeter film strips and then for the larger format negatives we typically just use the, the uh, flat film holders that come with a commercial scanner. And we tether the camera to a computer so that we can shoot directly from the computer and then write straight onto a hard drive and our hard drives are then backed up in triplicate. Uh, we try to keep the camera ISO down at 100 or 200 for the minimum noise possible and we use aperture settings of typically around f11 so that we can uh, maintain depth of field even if there is a little bit of variation uh, in the surfaces of the, uh, of the surface flatness of the, of the negatives. Shutter speeds can vary widely uh, based on the density of the negative film strips, and we typically shoot in aperture priority mode on the camera, uh, allowing the, the camera's uh, onboard computer to compute the shutter speed, and typically using kind of a wide frame uh, metering mode. Uh, we record both uh, JPEG and RAW files, and then as I said, we save these to external hard drives that we back up in triplicate. Uh, we've tried a couple of different setups for slides. Uh, for single slides, uh, we use the uh, Nikon film uh, adapter series, uh, which we then uh, shoot uh, into a, a, a big uh, light uh, board there on the left. Uh, we've also tried modifying a regular slide projector simply by removing its lens and putting a diffuser element in front of uh, the light source and then shooting straight into that. And that's worked pretty well for us too, uh, to allow us to go a little bit faster on some of these. 
So that's a little bit of the behind the scenes work of how we do our digitization work uh, and other archival work at the center. Uh, but of course, we've been talking about Don Furler's photography tonight, and I wanted to say a little bit more about that before we wrap up. And as Alan said, we published a book last year about Don's work. And uh, in the process of that, and also working on the collection, I had the great privilege of really learning a lot about Don as well as his photography. And I want to say just a little bit about that. And I see I, I still have my old uh, date on there. Sorry about that. This was from a, a previous show, and I forgot to change the title slide. Uh, so when Alan first approached us at the center, in one of our very early conversations, he asked me directly uh, what I, whether I thought that his father's photography with its more classical style, would be a good fit at the center uh, because we frequently place emphasis on creativity as well as the human side of railroading. And I reassured him that I considered his father's work to be one of the cornerstones of railroad photography, uh, something that all of us who came later have built upon. And now I meant those words when I said them, and I have since come to understand the foundational nature of Don Furler's photography on an even deeper level. I need to give you a little bit of background here. And Don mentioned, or Alan mentioned earlier, some of the letters uh, that he kept from his dad. He made those available to us and they really helped me gain a better understanding uh, of Don and his work. Now he was a man who knew what he liked and also what he didn't like. And he was not shy about it when it came to talking about his photographic preferences. When he went shopping for his five by seven speed graphic camera, he wrote directly to the former Graphlex Corporation of Rochester, New York, explaining that the camera which I intend to purchase is to be used for one purpose only, that of photographing railroad trains in action. And when it came to photographing railroad trains in action, Don had very specific tastes. In a letter to Lynn Westcott at Trains Magazine, he wrote that a good action shot can show sufficient mechanical detail of the engine to be interesting from that standpoint and yet be dramatic enough to be effective. These are the kinds of pictures that Don took almost exclusively and the kind he wished to see in his favorite magazine. My severest criticism, he once wrote to Al Kambach, would be the high proportion of quote, unusual views. Now, as I read more of Don's letters and came to understand what he meant by unusual views, I realize that they are often exactly the sorts of shots that I have tried to capture in my own photo photographic career over the past two decades. So you might be wondering now, why did I end up writing a book about Donald W. Furler's photography? So I have to talk a little bit about Don's methodology, as well as my own thought process for selecting photographs for the book. And in, in doing this, I hope to show you a little bit more of why his photography came to mean so much to me. And one thing I found is that tastes change. Don certainly did, thanks in part to his dialogue with Kambach and Westcott, and thanks as well to his many friendships with other photographers, including Jim Shaughnessy, who took no shortage of unusual views himself, and which Don came to appreciate and even admire. My own taste also evolved over the course of this project, as seeing Don's work helped remind me of some of my earliest railroad interests long before I was a photographer with a camera seeking unusual views of the diesel railroad, I was a kid with a pencil trying to draw steam locomotives. And there's at least one part of Don's photographic philosophy where I stand in complete agreement to take but few pictures if necessary and take them well. Now, when I started working on Don's collection, I have to admit that I harbored a certain bias against photographers like Don Furler, uh, the ones who really stopped most of their shooting at, with the end of the steam era. I grew up entirely in the diesel era, and while I always thrilled at seeing steam engines on museum, tourist, and excursion trains, the diesel-powered railroad was my everyday experience. The diesel-powered railroad is the railroad I came to love, and it's the railroad that I still try to find interesting ways of portraying in my photography. Now, even without steam locomotives, the diesel-powered railroads of Don Furler's middle age offered far more variety and visual interest than many of today's railroads do now. Some of my first photographic heroes were Parker Lamb, Jim Shaughnessy, and Richard Steinheimer, who had been there for the end of steam, and then learned to embrace the world of the diesel so they could continue to make interesting railroad photographs. And so I wondered if they could do it, why didn't Don Furler? Now, when I've been able to overcome a bias in my life, it's often started from empathy. 
and from looking at a situation from someone else's perspective, and from walking the proverbial mile in their shoes. I can't go back to the 1940s and walk along the tracks with Don Furler, much as I wish I could. His collection arrived at the center when we were short-staffed, and until we were able to hire a new intern, I ended up digitizing the first couple thousand of Don's negatives myself. Now, that turned out to be something like taking a virtual walk with Don, and along the way I encountered one steam, steam locomotive after another, in one perfect action shot after another. And what gradually sank in, in a way that it never really had sunk in for me before, was how these living machines had once been the everyday fabric of railroading, part of the everyday fabric of life itself. When you love something and you get to experience it every day, what a profound sense of loss you must feel when it's gone. As I process these negatives in the quiet early morning hours at our office, before the phone started ringing and anyone else was there, I made my peace with Don Furler and with all the steam photographers who hung up their cameras after the diesels came. Don's photographs put me in their shoes, or at least as close as I could come from the 21st century. I no longer blame them for what they did not shoot. I celebrate them for what they did photograph, for what they saved, so that we can enjoy it today and see a little of the world as they saw it through their eyes. Thanks so much. And I know Alan and I will both be happy to take any questions for those of you who have stuck around. If you don't have the book yet, it is available on our website, railphoto-art.org uh, slash books. It retails for $60 uh, plus five for shipping. Please know that with the global supply chain as it is these days, our shipping is a little bit delayed. We're actually having to do a lot of it ourselves uh, from our office while our distributor works through some labor problems. Uh, but again, if you're interested in this, we'll certainly get it shipped out to you just as quickly as we can. So thanks again. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Scott. And uh, my Scott, pleasure. Who wrote immediately after getting the Furler collection that uh, really hit home, having mm -hmm. known that Don didn't, didn't follow the rules, he made the rules. Yes, he did. <laughs> he created the image that everyone strives for, you know, just perfection. Down, clean outlines, um, engines usually against the sky or, or clean just to give a clean outline, use of lights and darks and shadows. There was one I saw tonight where the, the smoke plume just shadowed the tops of the, the, the locomotive, setting them off from the trees in the background. It's just, just perfect. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, thank you both so much for coming out. Uh, as always, uh, I greatly enjoyed Don Furler's photography. I have a copy of the book myself and uh, was happy to learn more about the uh, the center. Um, I believe yeah. we had. So do you remember way back when somebody commented that 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 photo with the stone walls was Shoddy Hollow Road, and the the town was cut off before I could get at it to see what town that was. I don't know record the comments. Right. Yeah, I went back and looked at it a little bit. They actually mentioned two roads, I think, but. Uh... Yeah, I, I want to get. Do you do you keep the comments afterwards, Richie? Or uh, I can. Do we lose? Do we lose them? Uh, I can keep them. Yeah, it says between Shoddy Hollow Road and Carnot Road, closer to Otisville. So I have to go back and look at that. But th thanks a lot for that. Oh, that was Eric. Okay, thanks, mm -hmm. Eric. Um, do have a couple questions in here. Um, I guess this is a question for Scott. Um, what is the best way to store slides? Uh, well, I guess I'd start by saying not in the cardboard boxes that they come back to you from the processor in. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, those often are, are uh, not acid free and, and that certainly can uh, hasten deterioration, especially if they're stored in, in warmer environments. Um, the, the metal Logan boxes and, and other similar boxes are, are generally pretty stable, although we're we're, we have not found where any of those have actually been subject to the photographic activity test that I mentioned earlier, uh, but we haven't seen any issues from them. Uh, the, probably the absolute best way is to use the clear plastic sleeves uh, that you get from print file or archival methods, making sure that those are, are acid-free uh, materials in those. And then, uh, and this is how we store most of our slides. 
And then we put those inside uh, archival clamshell binders that are actually light tight when they're shut. Uh, and then, you know, temperature and humidity are, are, are pretty important. You know, the cooler, the better. And um, dry, but not too dry, like 40% or so relative humidity is pretty good. And, you know, if you can keep these under, under 60 degrees, you're going to be well ahead of the game in terms of, of prolonging their longevity. I know that's not possible for everyone, but, you know, try to keep them out of the basement if it's really wet down there. Try to keep them out of the attic if it gets hot or up there in the summer, or really cold in the winter. You really want to try to minimize exposure to those big swings in temperature and humidity and maintain a more stable environment. And for my own, also do not keep them, you want to keep them cool and dark, number one, and don't keep them anywhere near a carpet. There are mites that live in a carpet that love film emulsion. Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of bad things that can happen to photographs over time, unfortunately. Uh, there's another question here for Alan. Uh, Alan, did your father happen to have any photos of trains passing the coal pockets in Allendale, New Jersey? I don't know. I guess I don't know about the coal pockets in Allendale offhand. But uh, he has a lot of photographs in that area, as does David Maney. Uh, but I, I don't specifically know the answer to that. Okay. That doesn't really uh, well for me either, Alan, but yeah, it certainly doesn't rule it out. Okay. Does anybody, Mike, do you know? Uh, and what, what's the significance of the coal pockets? Um, I, I don't know, but I don't recall any of Don's pictures there either. You know, in fact, I don't recall anybody's pictures there. No. Okay. Um, well, I do not see any further questions. Um, a lot of positive comments. I was watching. Oh, certainly. I mean, hundreds of them. <laughs> yeah. How many? How many? How many participants? Or how many? How many were in the audience? Uh, uh, well yeah. over a hundred. I was looking at it. I think we peaked between Facebook and Zoom, uh, like 115, 120. Well, I saw just Zoom alone peaked over a hundred. So that was that was great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, another question for Scott. Um, just came in. How does the center raise its funds? Well, uh, like Tri-State, we're a membership-supported organization. We have uh, close to a thousand members nationwide now. Uh, we also apply for, for a few grants and are sometimes successful with those. Publications, sales, like the Furler book, uh, that all goes back to our, our operating uh, income. So uh, that's kind of the, the, and we also have been fortunate to, to launch an endowment fund and that provides a steady stream of income uh, and you know, people who are, have been in the position to make estate or legacy gifts uh, through their wills. Um, some people have, have put uh, our endowment there and that's a, a really great source of, of funding for us, not just in the moment, but long-term, which is, is what we need to be able to preserve these images, not just now, but for the future. So if you're interested in supporting our work, and I know I, know, uh, I don't wanna compete with your, you for members here at Dry State, but if, uh, if you like what we do at the center, we'd love to have you as a member and, and you'll receive our quarterly journal, Railroad Heritage, as part of that. That's great. Good job, Dad. <laughs> it's like, well, at least one of your daughters is online tonight. Adam. <laughs> I told him not. <laughs> I told him not to, actually, because I knew it was going to be recorded. And, you know, it makes me nervous when they're on. <laughs> you, you said earlier about not being able to hear the audience and read the room and and one of our, and I, which I completely relate to, and one of our, our earlier presenters at one of our events, uh, Drake Hokanson, uh, it's really summed it up well for me. He said, it's, it's like shouting into a canyon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I've done a lot on Zoom with family and whatnot, but never presentation. But it's a long presentation. After a while, you begin to wonder if you've got <laughs> is, it, is anyone listening to this? <laughs> at least nobody's going to interrupt you, you know? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Uh, we had another question come in for Alan. Uh, Alan, do you have a favorite photo photograph among your father's work? Oh, that's that's really hard to say. I could probably pick out a favorite for each railroad or something, but uh, I mean, some of the best ones. I mean, there were some good ones tonight that I mentioned that I like. Uh, he he is also a favorite. Great favorite from him was Lehigh and Hudson, which we didn't talk about tonight. But he loved the pastoral scenes out there. I mean, that you, he probably has uh, you know a hundred that you would I would call really good ones on Lehigh and Hudson. It just you know it gets boring after a while. But he just got a lot of good stuff there. There's another one that I don't know if you can see this here. I'm playing with my camera for a second. 
on my wall above my desk is one that's not from local area. Let's see. Back up a little bit. Right. I guess I can't quite reach. But anyway, this is one. I, uh, you can't really see it. It's a good one, but I'm sorry. This is in the book. But, um, it's, a, it's a picture that my dad took in, on the Chesapeake in Ohio in Allegheny, Virginia. And uh, the reason it, it's a favorite, and I know it was his favorite, is because it hung in his living room mantle for 30 years or so. Gordon Roth, who's a uh, I don't think he's with us tonight, but good, good friend and professional photographer. He, he's still, you know, um, with us uh, alive. He uh, uh, was a professional and had a dark room, and he made some large enlargements of uh, my dad's stuff, including that one which was mounted on the wall. And it, so, since I knew, I know my dad loved it, and it is very good. I I consider that a favorite. When I first went approached Scott at the center, I showed up with these enlargements that uh, when I, the first time I, I think I came to see Scott in person, I showed up with this stack of about 30 of these giant enlargements to, uh, to show him what it was all about. And uh, I still have many of those, but uh, from the 50s, they're not new. No, these are archival prints from the, you know, made in the, the 50s, my wife's correcting me in the background, I guess. And incidentally, I saw in the chat that something about, uh, Scott, you you incorrectly said that I had scanned a lot of prints. I actually, I mean, I may have scanned some personal photos of my dad and things that were, were, were prints, but almost anything I've ever done, even before I got with the center, was scanning directly from negatives. Okay, oh, I didn't realize that. Um, we actually had a comment from a another... Uh known railroad photographer, Steve Barry, um, whose comment echoes my feelings about the Furler book as well. It says the Furler book is one of the best Northeastern steam pictorials ever assembled. Just get it. Can't agree more. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. We'll say whoever processed the negatives that are in the book did a great job. The shadows are just open enough. The highlights are just exactly right. You can see every grain and- well, um, I'll take credit for not screwing up uh, the phenomenal uh, <laughs> negatives that, that Don created. Uh, they were, I mean, his, uh, I, I know, I know negative film is more forgiving than slide film, but I tell you, his exposures were always just utterly spot on. Um, obviously, there were some dark, heavy days that, you know, required a little bit of opening up the shadows, but, but his, his negatives are just, just works of art in themselves. And, uh, and Don did love the Lehigh and Hudson, and I remember him and Collins constantly kidding about Craigsville. There was a, a, a Don could get the Heidi light and and uh, Collins would, would always make fun of Furler because that milepost was in the way. So Don Furler, uh, he let milepost out right down next to the railroad. They'd come back a week later and the milepost is back where it was. <laughs> and I would get his picture. You know? <laughs> Um, actually, a couple more questions come in uh, for Scott. Uh, any tips for uh, digital photographers in terms of storing, cataloging for posterity? Um, you know, this is this is an area where the, the technology and best practices are, are changing pretty rapidly. Um, you know, in terms of storage, we we really advocate for obviously duplicating things or, or even storing things in triplicate if possible. For our own hard drives, we try to buy them from dif different manufacturers and even use different technologies just to cut down on the possibility of things failing simultaneously. So we typically have, uh, for the three drives that we that we would store a collection on, we would have two magnetic drives from different manufacturers and then a third on a on a actual flash drive. Um, so that you know, hopefully buys us a little bit of uh, of, of uh, fail safes there. Um, and you know, with with all photography, the, the most important things to get noted are the locations and dates. Uh, and you know, a lot of other things you can figure out, but if you don't have those starting points, it can be a real challenge. And I know Alan and I spent a lot of time and Alan especially tracking down a few pictures and thankfully his dad's notes were phenomenal on most of his negatives, but there were a few that, that weren't labeled and, and uh, figuring out where those were took a, a lot of effort in, in some cases. So getting that, that uh, information down either, you know, through a cataloging program like Adobe Bridge or Lightroom or, or even in a spreadsheet where you can correlate it back to a file name. That's really important too. Um, we had another question come in. So it says, 
uh, this person says the center sounds like a great well organized repository for uh, railroad photograph collections. I'll kind of rephrase this a little bit. Is the center the first of its kind uh, in this? I mean, uh, I, I'd say that we're we're the only railroad organization I'm aware of that has this focus on on photography and art. Uh, there's certainly a lot of other great organizations that have some pretty significant archival holdings, uh, but in a lot of places, it's it's something that that we do in addition to other things and. And I do think we're unique in, in having this this really strong and clear focus on on photography and art. Um, certainly, something we're very passionate about and, and want to do the best job we can at it. Okay. Um, and this question kind of falls off the earlier question about slides, and I'd imagine that the answers might be largely the same. But uh, for storing prints, uh, mm -hmm. tips and practices. Prints are, are actually a little bit more forgiving than slides and negatives, but again, you want to you know maintain a, a cool and, and stable environment if possible. Um, you know, out of in the dark, uh, away from um, as Mike says, carpet or anything else that might have have a pest that can get in and, and do some damage. So you know, again, just just keeping things relatively cool and dry. Prints don't really need to be um, you know kept in, in refrigeration like like some of the older slide and, and, uh, and negative formats would be. Just uh, even in a cool office setting um, would typically be adequate there. They're a little bit you know they're, they're not as reactive as the, as the, the negatives and, and slides typically. Okay. Uh, and obviously again if you keep them in, in acid-free boxes that's that's really kind of the, the gold standard to make sure there's no chance for that that kind of interaction to occur. Cool, thank you. Um, question for Alan. Uh, so based on the large number of shots with bare trees, did your father prefer to photograph in the winter for better steam effects? Uh, I don't know if he, he went out in all seasons. Uh, so I'm not sure that that, he, he was not, he was not a, above going out in the winter. I mean, he liked getting winter shots. Although they're, you know, it's somewhat more challenging photographically too with, with the low speeds because you know you get parts of it wash out and you know it's hard to get the detail of the engine without, you know, in those conditions sometimes. But uh, I, I don't know that he really had a preference. He uh, he told stories about one time where he he felt he nearly froze to death on the on the Ulster and Delaware mm. when he went out following a ski train and I think I think I guess we say something and there's something in the book about that cat the caption on one of those photos but uh, his his shutter froze and he apparently got caught adrift uh, between the river and the tracks and you know it was <laughs> he was really trapped and uh, so, but he, there were a number of other times he went out in the snow and got some pretty dramatic shots in the snow. But uh, I, I, don't, I don't know that it was really a preference, but he, he went for it. The, uh, the winters in the Catskills are quite unforgiving. So uh, I can relate to your dad there. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes up on the, you know, at the end of steam on the DNH up in that area too, that got, got pretty snowy, pretty deep. Okay. But no, yeah, you're right, Alan. I mean, it's 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 all all seasons. It seems like he, uh, if it was a a decent day to get out, he would get out there regardless of what time of year it was. Um, so it looks like we're all caught up on the questions. Uh, Del Vecchio, do you have any uh, closing remarks? Uh, no, just thank you too again. It was a wonderful presentation. The the, uh, the hundreds of positive comments. You had hundreds of viewers. Uh, thank you very much. A great way to wrap up the year. Um, one little news item I forgot to mention earlier, uh, Amtrak uh, just released one ACS 64s in the AEM7 paint scheme as part of the 50th. And, uh, and it was sponsored by the train sim people. So it's kind of hmm. interesting corridor as we speak. Hmm. So uh, Alan and Scott, thank you so much. Terrific show. Great to see this stuff again. Thank you. Really Thanks a lot. Yeah. Great to see you. Be thank well, you. Mike. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, you too, Scott, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Right. Happy holidays, everybody. Happy yeah. holidays. Happy uh, holidays. Thank you for tuning in, everybody. We will be joining you back on the second Thursday in January. Good night. Good night. Good night.